will be using Noon Setting Daily Prayer, page 296 in the Lutheran Service Book. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me and answer me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. You will never let the righteous fall. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. For our psalm today, I will be using Psalm 132. Psalm 132. Remember, O Lord, in David's favor, all the hardships he endured, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house or go into my bed. I will not give up sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we heard of it in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of Jahar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your saints shout for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. The Lord swore to David a sure oath, from which you will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my covenants and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. For the Lord has chosen Zion, he has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, and I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priests I will clothe with salvation, and her saints will shout for joy. There I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. That, of course, is one of the Messianic Psalms. Looking forward to the heir of David, who will, well, not only be the king of Israel, but also David's king. So, uh, looking forward to the Messiah coming, entering in the, into the presence of the people. Now we turn to our scripture reading of the day, which comes from John chapter 11. Uh, this is going to be verses 5 to 10. Now Jesus is going to point to himself in this passage, talking about how that, uh, basically how you operate, how you live, should be in the light so that you do not stumble, that is, fall into sin. Uh, but it's also interesting that this psalm came up because I go through the psalms and just kind of cycle through them. And this is coming up uh, at this point in time in the scriptures, or sorry, this point in time when I'm going through the book of John because, well, uh, chapter 11 is basically setting things up for Jesus to take his uh, ultimate place as the one who is the resurrection and the life. Uh, chapter 11 happening fairly soon before the triumphal entry in Jesus last uh, week on uh, last week before his death or I guess to be accurate to the full seven days last week before his resurrection so the second half of the book of John chapters 11 to 20 actually happen within about the span of two weeks thereabouts so you have most of the gospel being reduced to two weeks, actually. Uh, chapter 11 probably being around a week thereabouts. Uh, chapters 12 to 20 being just one week. Oh, well, well uh, I, I should exp with the <laughs> Actually, sorry, the, the final little bit there with the description of doubting Thomas, that, that takes another week to, to actually be resolved. But essentially, chapters 12 to the first half of 20 is... This one. So, John chapter 11, verses 5 to 10. 
Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Then, after he had heard that Lazarus was sick, he remained still two days in the same place where he was. Then, after that, he said to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples said to him, Master, lately the Jews tried to stone you, and will you go there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If a man walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he, say, he sees the light of this world. But if a man walks in the night, he stumbles, because there is no light in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'll just uh, go through this kind of verse by verse. So Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So this was already somewhat stated in the first few verses before this. But Jesus loved Martha, Mary, Lazarus. What does this mean? Well, this means that Jesus <laughs> cared for them very much. Not in the sense that we would typically have, well, love is just kind of an emotion type of thing. When we find love in the Bible, it is more than emotion. It is also uh, being driven to action. So... Let's say you have married couple, married couples together for a long time, um, and maybe they even get tired of each other, and they do not uh, have the same emotions for each other that they once did. Well, the idea within society is that once that emotional love is gone, then it is okay for them to split ways and go in different directions. But within the Christian understanding of this, uh, lo love is where you act in care of the other person well beyond yourself. So even if the emotions are gone, you still love your spouse and do what you can for them. So even if the emotions are, are not there to support the relationship, your love, that is, your caring for your spouse, still should uh, carry you through that relationship. So when Jesus is stated here to love Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. It is not that Jesus has an emotional affinity for them. It is that Jesus actively cares for them and that he is going to take care of them in the best way he knows how. And this is going to be uh, articulated later on, John chapter 15, where Jesus says, there is no greater love than this, that, that one lays down his life for his friends. So this is kind of the love that Jesus is experiencing for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, is that he is willing to give of himself to the point of death so that he can actually care for these individuals. So Jesus really loves them. He is going to do what he can to, to protect them, to take care of them, make sure that they're all right. But in the next verse, it sounds kind of odd what's going on. So Jesus loves them. Uh, you will love them even to death on the cross. But in verse 6, it says, After Jesus had heard Lazarus was sick, Jesus remained still two days in the same place where he was. Okay. So, you will love this person, you're willing to take care of them. And even if you should die to do so, you're going to take care of them. Then you hear that they're sick. Then you stay there for a couple days. You, 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 don't go, you don't go over to your friend who is sick, don't, care for, don't go out to care for them. You just stay where you are for a couple extra days. And Jesus was deliberately doing this. It, it, it's, not that, um, it's not that he had uh, appointments that he couldn't give up to go and see Lazarus. It's that he deliberately stayed two days extra to make sure that Lazarus would be dead. So that when uh, Jesus... When, when Jesus goes to him, as he, as he says in verse 4, so Jesus says that this infirmity is not unto death, that is, that this is not unto an eternal death, but that uh, Lazarus will simply be dead in the flesh. So this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be praised by reason of it. 
So Jesus is making sure that Lazarus is indeed dead so that everyone also knows Lazarus is indeed dead in the flesh so that Jesus can show what life truly is by raising Lazarus. Spoiler alert. But when Jesus stays an extra couple days here, it does seem somewhat uncaring, somewhat unloving, and certainly not descriptive of one who is loving Lazarus uh, beyond the point, uh, the, loving Lazarus to the point where you would give your own life for him. Now, this is confusing, confusing, but what is actually happening is that Jesus is recognizing the fullness of time. So, yes, Lazarus is going to death in the flesh, and yes, this will be a horrible thing. Uh, as Jesus himself will admit by words and actions, well, more so actions than words, later on in the chapter. But what Jesus is acknowledging is that Lazarus is not in true danger. So Lazarus is loved by our Lord Jesus Christ. This means more than a simple emotional connection. It means more than you're just going to serve them to the best of your ability here in this lifetime. What this means is that our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, loves this individual so that he will not let death, eternal punishment, come to this individual. So even though the, res so the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ has not yet happened in the life of Jesus, Lazarus will still be given life, still be given the life that Jesus offers up on the cross. So because Lazarus has uh, partook of the bread of life by faith, I'm referencing John chapter 6, because Lazarus has partaken of Jesus Christ by faith, Lazarus is now in the life of Christ and will not be going down to an eternal death. So even though his flesh will it is deceased and it no longer houses his spirit because that's what death is, is when uh, the flesh begins to decay because there is no longer life within it, the spirit has returned to God who gave it. So separation of body and spirit, that is what death is in, in scripture. So that has happened to Lazarus, but Lazarus is still maintained, still guarded over, still overseen by our Lord and is protected by him, awaiting the resurrection, uh, the grand resurrection after the at the final judgment, where we will enter into the kingdom of God, the new heavens and the new earth, and dwell with our Lord forever. So this promise is already with Lazarus. He is partaking of this promise at this time. So even though Lazarus is going to be dead in the flesh, where his spirit and flesh separate, Lazarus will not be truly dead because he is alive in Christ. So even though Jesus is remaining two days, not taking care of his sick friend who's, who is off to the side dying, Jesus is still loving Lazarus by preserving his life and loving others in addition to Lazarus, uh, namely Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, so that they also know what true love is, which is our participation in the life of Jesus Christ, where he enlivens you and brings you to life in the greatness of his resurrection. So, Lazarus is going down into a temporary death, you could say, where body and spirit it separate, but Jesus Christ is still loving Lazarus and everyone around Lazarus, so that Lazarus will be risen from the dead, will be raised from the dead. Got to add that proper English in there. Lazarus will be raised from the dead, and Mary, Martha, disciples, all onlookers, all people understanding these things by the words found in Scripture, we may know what true love is, which is Jesus Christ enlivening us by his so that is why this is for the glory of God, and this is why Jesus is uh, staying away. So everybody knows that Lazarus is truly deceased. His spirit has truly left his body. But that does not mean that he is truly dead in the sense that he still has life in Christ. So, 
It's a promise given to us and a promise proclaimed every time we go to a funeral service. So at, at, the fun at a funeral service, a Christian funeral service, when we see somebody lying there and we know that they are dead in the flesh, like the, the spirit has gone, the flesh is decaying, like this person by all accounts is deceased. The message proclaimed and at, at the funeral service, and I really hope it is proclaimed at the funeral service. I know there are some uh, bad preachers out there who will not touch upon this, but the true message of hope in the funeral service is that this person is not truly dead, but alive in Christ, awaiting the resurrection from the dead, so that this person will this person's spirit will be joined back to their body, the body will be renewed, and this person will stand new in Christ at the resurrection with you as a fellow believer in Christ so that you may enjoy eternity with your Lord together with them. Okay. So this is the hopeful message that Mary and Martha and the disciples themselves will partake in, but it's not terribly obvious at the time. The only context that these people have at the time is that they know that Jesus loves them, but they do not understand why he is allowing Lazarus to go down into death. They don't understand. So, but after spending two days away from Lazarus so that he may be deceased, uh, Jesus under knows what has happened to Lazarus and says to the disciples, this is verse 7, let us go into Judea again. So, uh, Jesus is outside of Judea. Judea is the southern part of the nation of Israel. So Jesus is most likely in Galilee at this time. Or, well, no, no, he wouldn't be at Galilee at this time. He would be kind of on the way to Jerusalem. Because in the other gospel accounts, Jesus is setting his face to Jerusalem and he spends a long time getting there. But he's outside of the land of Judea for a long, long time. So Jesus is outside the land and then says, let's go back to Judea, which has Jerusalem in it. So the disciples, in response to this, this is verse 8. Disciples say to him, uh, Lord, lately the Jews tried to stone you and you will go there again. <laughs> so they're very much concerned for, well, the life of Jesus because people are seeking to kill him. So this was just last chapter, John chapter 10, when Jesus is saying that uh, I and the Father are one. And then all the Jews who are in earshot of this, they pick up stones and they're going, you committed blasphemy. You said that you're God. And Jesus basically said, well, yeah, that's, well, scripture says that people call themselves gods all the time, those who are exercising God's authority. So there is a scriptural precedent for this. So why are you trying to say that I'm blaspheming when I'm rightly doing this as the son of God, who is actually doing the work of my father in heaven and actually he being God in the flesh. That, that's mainly, that's basically Jesus' point, is that I am, I am evidencing of myself that I am truly God. So why don't you believe me, even with the scriptural precedent, that this, is, this should be the case? So uh, they have people trying to stone him at that time. There's, other, there's a couple other instances where uh, Jesus is threatened with stoning, or at least um, with a trial by the Pharisees. So the idea that the, Jew, that the disciples are trying to bring across is that Jesus, if you go back there, they're going to kill you. So they think that Jesus is in danger of death if he goes back again, so they don't understand why he want, they'd want to go back, even with uh, Lazarus being sick. Uh, so the disciples don't understand at this time that Lazarus is dead. Um, and if he's dead, then they would know that Jesus wouldn't be able to help Lazarus anyway. So... Why would Jesus need to go back there? Uh, at this point, too, because this is fairly late in Jesus' ministry, like right before the, the Palm Sunday, or at least shortly before Palm Sunday, the disciples would have also been witnesses to um, the centurion who goes up to Jesus Christ, who, who asked for his servant to be healed from a sickness, and Jesus heals the servant of the centurion, from a distance. So uh, they know that Jesus, if he wanted to, could heal Lazarus as a, at a distance, but they're just kind of concerned, well, Jesus, why are you going there if you don't need to? 
But Jesus responds, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If a man walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if a man walks in the night, he stumbles because there is no light in him. So what does this mean? Well, Jesus is pointing out, well, essentially the difference between light and darkness. So Jesus is saying, are there not twelve hours in the day? If a man walks in the day, he, is, he does not stumble because he has the light of this world. So he's saying that the light of the world is relatively finite. <laughs> he's saying there, there are 12 hours in a day. So in a day, there's more than 12 hours, and uh, part of it's darkness, part of it's light. And you kind of go, well, aren't there, doesn't that really depend on the time of year, how many hours are in a, are light in a day? Well, at this point in time, actually, the a day would be chopped up into a number of hours. So depending on the time of year, the length of the hour would shorten or increase so that you have the same number of hours in the day. Yeah, so that, that's, kind of, that's kind of what's going on here. But the important point that Jesus is talking about is actually not the number of hours in the day, but the ability to work and walk so that you do not stumble. So Jesus is looking at the daylight and focusing on the daylight because when it is night it's harder to see and you're going to go about stumbling. So this is well before the time of night lights, well before the time of street lights. So uh, when it is dark at this point in the world's history, it is dark. You can try and light some fires. In the city you can have some uh, fires going about. You can even have guard posts which would have a uh, fires there so that on the walls you can look out for any possible threats but it's going to be dark even inside a city the point that jesus is trying to make is that uh, at night it is far easier to make mistakes and stumble rather than being in the light and this is following in the theme of john or one of the themes that john presents in his gospel which is that Jesus Christ is himself the light. Those who are in darkness are those who reject Christ and embrace their sin. So those who are hiding from the light of Christ, those who are hiding from his glory, his salvation, and his forgiveness so that they can remain in their sin, they are in the darkness and they will continue in their sin because they are in darkness and continue to stumble. And that's the idea of the darkness, is that you are stumbling in the darkness because you do not have uh, the light, knowledge, the life of Christ with you. You are alone and in your own in sinfulness. So as you are sinful, you will commit sins. But Jesus Christ is the light. Those who are in the light, they will, uh, they will be free from stumbling, not that we as Christians are completely free from sin, but that we as Christians are freed from the guilt of sin because of the forgiveness of Christ given to us by faith. So as you are in the faith, you are freed from the guilt of sin. You are in the forgiveness of Christ. Your sins do not count against you anymore. You are completely righteous and holy in God's sight because of Christ. John really has those black and white pictures, or light and darkness pictures, in, in his gospel. So you're either in the forgiveness of Christ, or you're not in the forgiveness of Christ, and you're forsaken. So those who are in the light of Christ, they are in the forgiveness of Christ. They are not accounted for according to their sins anymore, but only, to the perfect, only because of the perfection of Christ. That's how you're accounted. So Jesus is saying, um, if a man walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world light of this world. So Jesus Christ is himself the light that has entered into the world. So this is the statement that he makes towards the beginning of John chapter 8. So John chapter 8 verse 12. Jesus spoke uh, to the people saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So Jesus is associating the light with life itself. Because Jesus was the light of life in the beginning of the world, by which all things were uh, enlivened, enlightened, 
and created. And it worked. So when Jesus is going about in the world as the light of the world, he is going about as the life given to all people. So the Jews, sorry, uh, the disciples are scared that the Jews will kill Christ. But Jesus is answering, well, you're in the light of life right now. So I am the one who is is allowing, uh, is uh, uh, giving you life. I'm life itself. So as long as I am going about doing what I need to, so walking, as the metaphor is, no one will stumble. No one will be uh, affected by sin or the consequences of sin. So that is, uh, those who are walking by the light of Christ, they will not be affected by uh, the, the consequence of sin, which is death, the wages of sin, but will continue on walking in Christ. So he's essentially saying the fears of the disciples are unwarranted and uh, the darkness of the Jews well, they cannot hold up to his light. So as long as Jesus goes, as long as Jesus is, uh, does his works that or walks, you will walk behind him having his light and you will not stumble. You will, you will not fall prey to uh, anything in this world that Jesus cannot deliver you from. So Jesus will deliver them from this. So Jesus is also kind of hinting at well, what's going to happen to Lazarus? So Lazarus is dead. Jesus knows this. The disciples don't. But Jesus is the light of life. So when Jesus is walking towards Lazarus, he is bringing the light of life to Lazarus so that when he is in the presence of Lazarus, Lazarus will come back to life. That is, his spirit will be rejoined to his body so that he may live in this world once more. Lazarus is still alive, but just not in the sense of in this world, where you would have a body to, to go about by. Lazarus is with the Lord at this point. Now, so what does this mean for us? Well, for us, uh, yeah, we would go about walking about in the world. And even though Jesus Christ is not physically present with us in the sense that he was with the disciples, that uh, you, you have a... Uh, God in the flesh right beside you, walking alongside you in his flesh. Well, that doesn't happen. But Jesus Christ has still promised that he is with you in his word. He has promised that wherever two or three are gathered in his name, there he will be. So he's with us in every single worship service, uh, every single pastoral consultation, uh, every single conversation about uh, faith. And he has also promised that he is with us in the sacrament. So in the sacrament of baptism, this is done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Christ is present at baptism as well. And in the Lord's Supper, he is also present with us there. So it is not as though we are walking about in darkness because he is not physically present with us in the sense that, that he was with the disciples, but we still have the light of Christ given to us so that in faith we receive the life-giving word of Jesus Christ, sustained by the sacraments in which he dwells, and we uh, go forth as the church, surrounded by Jesus Christ, with him and his spirit coming with us. So we do have the light of the world given to us so that we do not fall prey to sin, that we are not uh, cast off into the darkness, but we have the light of Christ with us, a light that was with Lazarus and sustained Lazarus well beyond death to the resurrection. Amen. Uh, we continue with the service on page 296 with the Curie. O Lord, have mercy upon us. O Christ, have mercy upon us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. And help us forgive the trespasses as others commit against us. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for giving us Jesus Christ, your own dear Son, that we may be forgiven our sins, even those when 
He accidentally missed, uh, accidentally missed the words of the Lord's Prayer. Please forgive us our sins, and Jesus Christ our Lord, guide us by the light of his life, so that we are not judged into darkness because of our sins, judged into death because of them, but are wholly forgiven in him, so that we may walk in this world, spreading the light of Christ, so that all may come to life in his name and receive his salvation. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to direct and rule us according to your will, to comfort us in all our afflictions, defend us from all error, and to lead us into all truth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.